My name is Nora Arajärvi, and um, I recently left the Euro Expert, very recently in fact, with, uh, with a heavy heart to take up a position at the EUI in Florence. <coughs> Excuse me. So I have been with the Euro Expert since 2018, first as a data collector for Finland, and then as a postdoctoral fellow. My interest in cultural expertise stems from my uh, professional and personal experiences. I have worked as a lecturer of law, for example, in Trinidad and Tobago for one year, and in Cyprus as well. And um, yes, really been moving around quite a lot and encountering encountered different legal cultures and also how culture plays in legal education. Um, so I will talk about the data that was collected for Finland, Sweden and Denmark. I apologize in advance if it's a little bit heavy on the Finnish side because that's the country that where I did the work and therefore I am more familiar with that. Um, I should add that at the Euro Expert, I also then coordinated the review of cases and, and expert reports in compliance with the G GDPR as we drafted the guidelines for it last year. So, for Finland, there were altogether 210 respondents out of whom 53% uh, were experts, which was quite surprising, and uh, quite a few judges. So one third of the respond respondents were judges, with only 11% of lawyers. Um, for Sweden, the numbers were not too dissimilar, with 247 responses altogether. Again, about one third were judges, one third lawyers, one third experts. Um, and for Denmark, there were only 13% judges and majority were lawyers, with some experts. And I should add that um, the beneficiaries for all countries uh, were only a few. So the numbers range between 1% and 7%. And I think this is reflected also in the data collection for many other countries, that reaching beneficiaries for reasons that Livia has mentioned already is not such an easy task. And you often need to go through gatekeepers who may or may not want to grant you such access. So, on the usefulness, um, so these countries are not too far off from Poland, unfortunately. So, uh, maybe the situation is not quite as, as dire as Stanislav described, but... Still, the most common response to the question of the usefulness, so the perception of usefulness, was that it was moderately useful in Finland, or not useful at all, both with around 30%. Um, for Sweden, they, there was a little bit more positive attitude. The slightly useful was answered by 43% of the respondents. However, again, one-fifth said not at all useful. Uh, and in Denmark, it was perceived to be moderately useful, and even 26% considered it very useful. So in Denmark, actually, the attitudes are, uh, or the perceptions, are more positive than in Finland and Sweden. And uh, we can only guess the reasons for that, really. Perhaps it's to do with awareness, perhaps it's to do with the types of cases that have come to courts, uh, Perhaps it's something to do with the demographic, uh, but it's, it, I think this is something that may, may require further thinking. Um, on the frequency, so this is again reflection uh, quite in line with the perception of the usefulness, and for all the three countries, uh, the frequency of how many experts had been instructed annually by judges and lawyers was less than 10. But I'm not too pessimistic about this. I think that this is something that is changing. In Finland, for example, um, since 2016, which is only two years before we ran the survey, um, the appointment and examination of expert witnesses 
has been governed by Chapter 17 of the Code of Judicial Procedure, which opened up the appointment of experts also to the parties, whereas before this expert appointment was really the prerogative of the court. And con parties could only instruct experts as normal witnesses. So there has been a procedural shift, at least in Finland. And I'm already using my Hawken card, so I don't know about Sweden, but uh, I think Hawken will be able to give us more insights on that. Um, so it's, while well, the numbers don't look too great on the frequency, I do think that we, we shouldn't be too concerned that there is really room for development. On the typology of experts, um, in <clears throat> Finland, the most common response was other, nearly at 50%, followed by native language speakers. Um, university professors made up only 16% of the, of the responses. Out of those who were university professors, by far the most common area was law. All but one respondent answered law to this question. Uh, and the one that, who didn't was uh, coming from a medical background or had instructed a medical professional. Um, in Sweden, again, it's very similar. The answer was other, followed then by university professors and native speakers. <clears throat> there, for university professors, the di most common discipline was, again, law, but there was a bit more diversity with linguistics, sociology, history, anthropology, and political science being also mentioned. And However, in Denmark, native language speakers were the biggest group, followed then by university professors. So native language speakers made up 36% in this, this survey question. For university professors, again, same as in the other two Nordics, uh, it's law, but similar to Sweden, other disciplines were also mentioned ranging from political science to sociology, history, anthropology, linguistics, and so on. Uh, the remuneration seems to be very similar in the three countries, uh, as I noticed in many other Euro-expert countries as well. It's the standard hourly rate that seems to prevail. However, interestingly, in Finland and Denmark, as you can see, uh, over 30% uh, stated that the services were provided on a voluntary basis. I, am, I can't say for certain, but I believe this would be part of the NGO work. I interviewed one person from a human rights NGO, and they described that they do a lot of, lot of pro bono work um, because nobody else would do it. And the resources are not there really to cover it. Uh, and, but they do it nonetheless. I see Ibtisam nodding, and I think we've touched upon this before in other contexts. Um, so it's, it's something that is to be given some, some thought. Why is this, and maybe what, what can be improved? This links to also our policy recommendations that I'll touch upon, or I will discuss about tomorrow. <clears throat> Now, on the fields of law, there is quite a bit of diversity, I think, reflecting uh, quite on a similar way in the three countries, refugee and asylum law being quite high up, and together with immigration law. Now, criminal law also is an area where cultural expertise has been used quite a lot. For family law and administrative law, I should say that at least in Finland, it was not always so easy to distinguish, are we talking about administrative decision or a family decision when there are no specific family courts like in some other countries. Uh, so therefore, the administrative courts often are the places that take decisions in family cases. And Therefore, there may be a bit of a sort of overlap, on, and it depends how we understand administrative law. Are we strictly talking about 
administration or what the administrative court does. So there is some overlap in my view in, in at least some of the cases uh, in this regard. Now on the types of cases, and here I will talk a little bit more about the examples that we, we discovered. So in Finland, individual cultural experts are mainly appointed in certain high-profile cases involving terrorism practice and in cases concerning the rights of indigenous people, Sami people to be precise, that tend to focus on land rights, fishing and hunting rights. Uh, in these cases, experts have been usually legal academics, but also we found reports by anthropologists, historians, and experts in security studies. This links more than to the area I mentioned first, the terrorism cases. Quite a specific feature in Finland is the non-discrimination ombudsman, which was created fairly recently. So the ombudsman regularly submits expert reports in cases that involve discrimination. And here, this most often, based on the data we collected, involves discrimination of Roma persons or, or a group of Roma persons who were trying to gain access to a restaurant, a bar, shops, petrol stations, car rentals, getting a taxi ride or real estate services. In most of these cases, the courts found that uh, the respondents were indeed guilty of discrimination, which was always, I think I can say always, based on the data that we have, at least in most of the instances, the view of the ombudsman as well. They, they stated in their report, uh, in a very standard language, that this constitutes discrimination. A handful of expert reports were issued also in cases concerning religious attire or religious clothing, such as a case where a person was denied access to a shop because she was wearing a veil. Um, I should add that another category of cases that were dealt by administrative courts, and this concerned the traditional Roma dress, and in, <clears throat> there, there was really quite a few cases where, <clears throat> where a woman was applying to the welfare office to receive money to buy this traditional Roma dress, which by cultural reasons she needs to wear. And whether that constitutes a necessity that would then be covered by the welfare office or not. And these, these were quite interesting decisions and there was no clear pattern, so to say. Another frequent field where expert reports were submitted are asylum applications, and I think this is pretty much the same for every country. In these cases, um, the Finnish Human Rights League, an NGO, has often issued reports where in, in cases where there is a risk of FGM, so female genital mutilation, or honor related violence, if the appellant would be returned to their country of origin. And on the honor-related violence, surprisingly many of the applications were submitted by men. So it's not a, a gender-specific area. Uh, over, in, I should maybe clarify that these were cases where the man had, had um, for example, a relationship with a woman and the woman's family would then pose a threat to him if he would be returned or he had been involved in homosexual relationship. Um, also, priests and other members of religious institutions have submitted reports in support of asylum um, applications stating that the appellant is Christian or has converted into Christianity and therefore there would be an added, added risk if that person would be returned to their country of origin. Uh, so that was a, a lot, lot of examples from Finland. I have some from Sweden as well. Um, the most common cases in Sweden concern immigration cases, um, asylum and refugee applications, and deportation. 
um, ranging from questions of honor culture and forced marriage to polygamy. In discrimination cases, which also compose of a bulk of Swedish cases, uh, gender is sometimes a cause of contention. For example, when job seeker has refused to shake a male, a female job seeker has refused to shake a male interviewer's hand, or, or other way around. In cases concerning the Sami people, in Sweden there have been cases concerning property rights, and experts coming from history or experts of indigenous rights have appeared in courts or submitted expert reports in these cases. In a similar way as in Finland, the rights of the Roma people have been litigated in Swedish courts. And it has been recorded that the Swedish Equality Ombudsman frequently receives reports about discrimination of the Roma. Um, I don't think the Equality Ombudsman has quite the same role in Sweden as the Finnish Non-Discrimination Ombudsman. Um, but I think this is something that we can discuss more in detail later. I think it's an interesting comparison to see that these fairly similar roles uh, how how um, much legal legal power or legal um, competence they have. Now, in Denmark, then, cultural arguments and cultural expertise have emerged in cases involving terrorism, migration, and religion. The cases range from suspected terrorist activity and financing of terrorism to wearing of headscarves and discussion about the meaning of jihad, interpretation of Pakistani family law and paying dowry, as well as the use of illegal psychotropic substances for cultural or religious purposes, as well as the validity of verbal loan contracts between relatives for tax purposes. While outside the time scope of the data that EuroExpert has collected, in Denmark, the courts have also adjudicated cases of discrimination of minorities and violations of indigenous, indigenous rights in Greenland and in the Faroe Islands, including forcible removal of children to re-educate them into the mainstream Danish culture. But this dates really back to the, the cases uh, where this happened. Uh, so this happened in the 1950s, but the cases are are somewhat more, free, more recent. <clears throat> so the out-of-court sites of cultural expertise. Um, apart from in-court cultural expertise, most common sites in the Nordic countries vary from universities to NGOs, through private consultancies and to detention centres. So there really seem to be quite a bit of diversity on on. The, the locations where cultural expertise is provided. On the training programs, there, in Finland, there have been some courses intended for court interpreters and translators on culture. Um, there are also are projects mainly run by NGOs on advancing Sami welfare, as well as supporting Roma youth from marginalization, as well as specific projects then dealing with, uh, for example, helping Roma individuals who have been imprisoned to, to uh, get back on their feet, so to say. Um, but regarding the cultural expertise training, I would say really the court interpreters is the only tangible example um, I found. In Sweden, um, there are center, these two centers that provide intercultural training and com on communication between cultures, and they have various training courses, including those that are intended for professionals. So not just for the beneficiaries, but also to, to professionals. And um, for Denmark, then, they... Uh, there is a course in Roskilde University that specifically focuses on global studies and cultural encounters. Um, and otherwise, these examples that I have really are um, more on the same kind of 
cultural center type of training. Now, on the main sites and potential models for cultural expertise, um, I will say a few, few words about the Ombudsman for non-discrimination, which I already mentioned. So the legal reform in 2015 introduced this role, um, which requires that in a case where there is suspected discrimination, and the, the grounds are listed in this act, um, already the prosecutor should consult the Ombudsman. And also, if a court realizes that there might be discrimination, then the court must reserve an opportunity for the non-discrimination ombudsman to be heard or normally to submit a report. So it's not up to, it's not, it's not a voluntary exercise that one party might take. It is compulsory. Of course, the practical application is still not quite um, comprehensive, but uh, this, this is, uh, I think, an interesting development that really touches upon not only the Roma or other minorities, but it can, can have a broad application. Um, as I noted already, NGOs play a big role. We've been having quite a bit of interaction with the Finnish League for Human Rights. Um, and they, they are submitting quite a large number of expert reports annually um, with very little resources. And as I mentioned already, religious institutions also play a part. Oh, I should rather form, reformulate not institutions per se, but individuals within those institutions. So the reports were submitted by individual priests or other, other staff members who work within a religious institution. Um, and it's unclear whether this is something at the institutional level that's really endorsed by the Lutheran Church of Finland or not. So um, it's an individual's decision to submit or not to submit a report. Um, and there is no official register of experts in Finland. Similarly, in Sweden, there is no, no register as such. A public authority, an officer, a person specifically authorized to issue opinions, or a person known for their integrity and knowledge of a subject, may be called upon to deliver an opinion. In asylum cases, the Swedish Migration Agency appoints independent legal counselors who tend to be lawyers or legal experts paid by the Migration Agency. But the applicant can also choose their own representation. And in some cases, uh, apparently open access lists might be available in, in particular areas. Uh, so it, there is a lot of freedom to choose, but there is no, no um, one place where to find these experts. Uh, also, the EA, EASO has provided Sweden with some support for brief periods of time in immigration cases. Um, and operating across the northern parts of, the, of Scandinavia and the Nordics is the Sami parliament. So it, it, <coughs> they have Finnish, Swedish and no Norwegian um, offices or in institutional setups. And this is quite quite an interesting and important um, part of cultural expertise because they cover a lot of, lot of different areas. So they have their own sort, sort of governmental structure with some decision-making powers. Also, they, they work on raising awareness and take on on also opinions on certain cases. And some members of the Finnish um, side of the Sami parliament were involved in a highbrow case that went all the way up to constitutional court very recently concerning the Sami fishing rights. And this was, uh, this was really was strategic litigation. This woman who is a lawyer, human rights lawyer, she and a few others who are Sami people went fishing knowing that they were not allowed to fish on, on this specific point of a river at a specific time of the year. 
However, traditionally, they were doing that, but this new law prohibited anyone fishing there. And uh, they got uh, charged with, with um, violating this rule, and they, they got initially sentenced, they appealed, prosecutor appealed, they appealed, and at the end it was decided that they did indeed have this right to fish there, based on their, their historical uh, and cultural roots. Um, so this is not directly linked to the Sami parliament, but I believe there is a lot of this. this uh, what's happening behind the scenes is certainly interlinked. Um, in Denmark, then, public institutions and courts do have registers of experts in different areas of competence and knowledge from which the judge may choose an expert if needed. But often the courts appoint experts who are considered to be competent. So again, there, there is a freedom to appoint who you wish. And I know from Finnish experience that this can be also problematic because um, there is basically one professor who is always asked to provide an expert report, whether it's a terrorism case, indigenous rights case, or any other case that might have cons might concern international human rights. And it's this one single chap who's all, whose name is always there. So it creates a it creates certain limitations for junior experts to, to get in if there is this attitude. So um, in that sense, perhaps a more transparency and registers are indeed needed. Um, but going back to Denmark, the, there was some, some um, notion that, or some, some concern that was raised that in the recent years, whether the legislative branch has been reacting to certain um, new challenges, but this is more of a political discussion, and uh, I think it can be argued argued in different different ways. But just to to give you that little bit background, that it's um, there are these these uh, arguments that legislative is influenced by the by some political um, ideas currently that may not be so welcoming to cultural expertise.